What is good with y'all? WJ Gang. I'm back again with another reaction for y'all today, man. And as I can see by the title, we are going to react to No Fuel Over the Atlantic Ocean. The story of Flight 236. All right. If y'all new to the channel, man, don't forget to smash that thumbs up, share the video, and subscribe for more reactions. And for all my returning subscribers, bro, don't forget to comment down below what kind of reaction y'all want to see. Because I do want to uh, draw reactions for y'all. So, I need y'all to let me know what reactions I want to see down below so I can drop it for y'all, alright? Don't be lame, man. Just comment down anything y'all interested in. And, yeah, bro, I'll try to bring it for y'all, bro. That's the whole point of me being consistent right now. I ain't gonna slack, bro. If I see y'all comment something, I'm gonna bring it for y'all. Y'all feel me? So, yeah, man. Comment down what y'all want to see down below. And we ain't about to say much, y'all, on the road to 5K, y'all. Yeah, we're finna get straight into this video, man. Let's get it. Mayday, Mayday. Air Transat 236. The right engine has flamed out. And we're down to... Anyway, bro... That's another thing, bro. I, another fear is an airplane crash. Cause like, bro, what can you do? You just know that's your last day and that's it. Like, so airplane crashes, bro, it's not something I would wish on anybody. Like literally at all. Like there's nothing to play with. And yeah, and of course we do appreciate all these good pilots that's out there. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I don't wish none of that on nobody. That's a scary sight and that's a scary situation, y'all. Like literally. Like, what do you do in a situation like that? Just a few hundred kilograms of fuel left. Flying halfway across the Atlantic Ocean, the captain of an Airbus A330, carrying 293 passengers and 13 crew members, declared a mayday. Just minutes after his call, the situation worsened when the left engine also flamed out, leading to all lights shutting off and the deployment of oxygen masks due to the loss of cabin pressurization. In complete darkness, and with the aircraft's electrical system switched to emergency configuration, Whoa. the pilots struggled to control the aircraft, working hard to keep it flying. Meanwhile, the crew quickly prepared the passengers for a potential emergency water landing, aware that their chances of survival were slim. This is the story of Air Transat Flight. Wow, yeah. That is scary, bro. That's a scary situation. If the pilot was able to save all these people, bro, hey, you were a goat. Because I ain't gonna lie, in a situation like that, ain't nothing really much to say, but, you know, say your last prayers and, yeah, bro. Mayday, Mayday. On August 24th, 2001, Air Transat Flight 236 was pushed back from the gate at Toronto Pearson Airport, Canada, with destination Lisbon Airport, Portugal. The route from Toronto to Lisbon crosses the Atlantic Ocean. Starting in Canada, it travels over the Western Atlantic, crossing towards the European mainland before reaching Lisbon. This flight typically takes about seven hours. The aircraft designated for this flight was an Airbus A330, equipped with 362 passenger seats. Built in 1999, it had accumulated over 10,000 flying hours by the time of the incident. It was loaded with approximately 46.9 tons of fuel, 5.5 tons more than the minimum legal requirement. In the cockpit of the aircraft, there were two pilots, the captain was 48-year-old Robert Pichet, who had nearly 17,000 flying hours, with almost 800 of those on the Airbus A330. He was joined by the first officer, 28-year-old Dirk de Jager, who had accumulated 4,800 flying hours, 386 of which were on this specific aircraft type. Four days before Air Transat Flight 236 took off, it underwent routine maintenance. During this checkup, the maintenance team discovered metal chips in the aircraft's oil filter, a sign of potential engine trouble. Unable to pinpoint the source of these chips, they decided to replace the engine. The engine being installed, loaned by Rolls-Royce, was in a pre-service bulletin configuration. 
while the replaced engine was in a post-service configuration. This difference caused an issue for the technician in charge. The rear hydraulic pump from the removed engine couldn't be fitted onto the replacement engine. The reason was a clash with the fuel pump inlet tube already installed on the loaned engine. Un I ain't gonna lie, bro. Working on the airplane engine is crazy. You see all them things you gotta really like look at, bro. Like, what I'm supposed to know what to do with this? Like, who even made stuff like that? Like, sheesh. But anyway, y'all. Yeah, man. We, that's why we have mechanics and we leave that up to the airplane mechanics, bro. It's a clash with the fuel pump. His bulletins from the available computer terminals, the lead technician relied on advice from the maintenance engineering department. They recommended using only the rear fuel tube from the engine being replaced. By following this advice, the technicians were able to ensure there was enough space between the fuel tube and the nearby hydraulic tube. After installing the new engine, the technicians inspected the work and found no issues. The engine passed a ground run test, indicating it was functioning correctly, and the aircraft was approved for flight. Just before one in the morning, the Airbus took off. The pilots steered the aircraft eastward, ascending to a cruising altitude of 39,000 feet. The first hours of the flight went smoothly, with no issues on board. It was a calm and routine journey as the plane continued steadily toward its destination. Okay. But several hours into their journey, while halfway across the ocean, the pilots encountered something unusual. Upon checking the secondary display for engine readings, they spotted abnormalities in the right-hand engine's data. The oil pressure was unusually high, paired with a lower oil temperature and a decrease in oil quantity. These warnings presented a scenario that the pilots couldn't immediately understand. Normally, engine oil temperatures increase during a flight. So, when the pilots saw the oil temperature going down, they were confused. They looked through the manual to find an explanation. But they couldn't find anything that explained the strange readings they were seeing. The pilots reported the issue to their maintenance control center, asking for further investigation. However, the center also couldn't determine the cause of the problem. What the pilots didn't wow, know bro. was that the issues with the engine oil indications were caused by a massive fuel leak deep inside the right-hand engine. Ah. A serious mistake was made while replacing the engine. The hydraulic and fuel lines were placed too close to each other. Even though they believed there was sufficient space between them, they didn't consider how the pressure from the hydraulic system could affect them. During the flight, the hydraulic and fuel lines of the right engine were in continuous contact, slowly wearing down against each other. Eventually, this friction caused the fuel line to rupture, oh. resulting in a significant hole. According to the final report, the aircraft was losing an estimated 12 to 15 tons of fuel per hour through this wow. An immense contrast to the typical fuel consumption of about 2.6 tons per hour mm. for an Ooh. Airbus engine. But even with the significant fuel leak, the engine kept running as usual. The fuel system design of the aircraft... They should have started landing, bruh! The fuel system of this Airbus is designed with multiple fuel tanks. Each wing contains two tanks, along with a center tank and a trim tank located in the tail's horizontal stabilizer. The trim tank serves the purpose of redistributing fuel from the back to the front of the aircraft to maintain its central gravity limits. As fuel levels decrease in the wing tanks, the trim tank automatically transfers fuel forward to the depleted wing tanks. This transfer is normally not scheduled to take place until 35 minutes from the destination airport when the wing tanks are below 4 tons or when the aircraft descends below flight level 245. This process ensures a balanced fuel distribution for landing. However, in this instance, the trim tank initiated its final fuel transfer prematurely, directing all its remaining fuel forward into the wing tanks much earlier than usual. Despite mm. there being an indication because the there was a leak the pilots did because there was a leak and as the The leak is taking all the uh, that's away from the wing 
the Sinatrim is sending all that gas back, but it's also losing it. So them boys was losing a lot of gas. Not immediately recognize the abnormality. While still dealing with the oil pressure issue, an advisory message flashed on the ECAM. It's the central display unit in the cockpit, and it alerts the pilots when action is needed. It was an advisory message. The message noted a fuel imbalance between the tanks in the left wing and those in the right wing. A fuel imbalance means that there's more fuel in the tanks of one specific wing than in mm, the other, okay. which is a problem because the aircraft needs to be balanced. Right. When dealing with a fuel imbalance on the Airbus A330, there aren't any specific actions outlined in the ECAM. Instead, the ECAM simply alerts pilots to the imbalance, prompting them to refer to the Quick Reference Handbook for guidance. This handbook is designed to guide pilots through non-normal procedures. Given their familiarity with handling imbalances from simulator training, the captain decided to rely on their experience and memory rather than consulting the Quick Reference Handbook. They opened the crossfeed valve and shut off the fuel pumps in the right wing, intending to transfer fuel from one side to the other. However, unbeknownst to them, this action only worsened the fuel leak as fuel was being wow. directed from the left wing tank through the damaged right side of the aircraft. Had they consulted the QRH, the first instruction would have cautioned against proceeding with the checklist if a fuel leak was suspected. Within just 10 minutes, as they watched the fuel levels drop rapidly, the pilots realized that the total amount of fuel remaining on board had fallen below the level necessary to safely reach Lisbon. Facing this critical situation, they began exploring alternative landing sites. In the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, the pilots had limited options. They identified Leges Airport, located on the island of Terceira in Portugal, as a viable diversion point. As the pilots considered their diversion strategy, a cabin crew member entered the cockpit to inform them about passengers requiring assistance upon arriving at Lisbon Airport. The pilots explained the urgent need to divert to another airport due to a technical issue. They requested the cabin crew member to visually check the wings. Following the pilot's instructions, the crew member dimmed the cabin lights for a clearer view and used a flashlight to inspect the wings from the cabin windows. Despite the thorough check, no irregularities were detected. A fuel leak would be relatively easy to detect during daylight hours but spotting one at night becomes significantly more challenging. Yeah, bro. Because there were no signs of a fuel leak other and than the night time too? Oh my. Fuel on board. And at least no in the morning. Why are you telling me night time? Both pilots concluded that the issue was likely a computer malfunction. The pilots considered doing the standard fuel leak procedure but decided against it. Could it be a fuel leak? Should we start with the standard fuel leak procedure? No, we would then have to descend to a lower altitude, which would worsen the situation. Understood. Investigators later concluded that if the pilots had executed any of the prescribed fuel leak procedures upon diverting to Lages, whether it was the engine fuel leak procedure, the wing fuel leak procedure, or the fuel leak not located procedure, they would have landed with at least 3.8 metric tons of fuel on board. The captain's decision not to follow the fuel leak procedure was influenced by a common thinking mistake known as framing bias. This kind of bias happens when people get stuck on one way of looking at a problem and only pay attention to information that supports that view mm. while ignoring evidence that doesn't fit. In this case, the pilots thought the issue was just a computer error, so they focused on clues that seemed to confirm that idea. Because they were so focused on this belief, they didn't consider other important signs that could have pointed to a different problem. The pilots found themselves immersed in a whirlwind of tasks, communicating with maintenance control, conducting checklists, and coordinating with cabin crew and air traffic control for the diversion. Amidst this hectic environment, they struggled to find a moment to step back and reevaluate their initial assumptions. Despite their recent attempt to address the fuel imbalance by transferring fuel between tanks, the problem didn't go away, 
and fuel continued to drain rapidly. Wow. In reaction to the continued abnormally high rate of reduction in the fuel on board quantity reading, the crew selected the right wing fuel pumps to on and the left wing pumps to off. These selections established cross feed of the fuel in the right wing tanks to both engines. The pilots then set a course for Lages Airport. They notified Santa Maria Air Traffic Control of their diversion, citing a critical fuel shortage. By this point, the aircraft was carrying seven tons of fuel, which accounts for merely 6% of the aircraft's total fuel capacity. As the fuel levels kept dropping at an alarming rate, the captain maintained communication with the maintenance control center. In an effort to resolve the problem, he experimented with various configurations of the fuel system. However, despite these attempts, the amount of fuel continued to decrease. Any remaining doubts were quickly cleared when the right-hand engine flamed out, occurring as the aircraft Whoa. was at flight level 390. Flamed out? That was 150 miles from the airport. In response, the captain swiftly increased thrust to the remaining engine. Although the aircraft could still stay airborne with only one engine functioning, maintaining an altitude of 39,000 feet was no longer feasible. At this critical juncture, the aircraft's fuel dwindled to a mere 600 kilograms. The pilots realized that they were facing a life and death situation. The first officer declared an emergency to air traffic control. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday! Air Transat 236. The right engine has flamed out. And we're down to just a few hundred kilograms of fuel left. Moments later, the first officer used the public address system to inform the cabin crew and passengers that they would be landing shortly and to prepare for the possibility of an emergency water landing. Thirteen minutes after the right-hand engine flamed out and still 120 kilometers from the airport. Bro, imagine everybody on that flight, bro, just like panicking right now. Like, oh my God, we about to crash. Whoever was on the left side of the airplane probably like, bro, look at the freaking thing on fire. Like, bro, it's all types of emotions at this point. You know what I'm saying? So that's not a good situation to be at. <laughs> so at all, bro, it's not. As electrical power failed, the cockpit was enveloped in darkness. As the plane descended, the cabin pressure dropped, causing oxygen levels to decrease. Wow. Passengers and crew had to put their oxygen masks on. With both engines having stopped working, the aircraft lost its main source of electrical power. Okay. A crucial fail-safe mechanism, the ram air turbine, deployed from beneath the aircraft. As the plane moved through the air, this device harnessed the wind to generate a small amount of electricity, sufficient to keep the most important instruments and systems operational. However, the absence of engine power resulted in the loss of wing spoilers, nose wheel steering, and thrust reverses, making maneuvering and landing significantly more challenging for the mm -hmm. pilots. The crew finished the procedure for when all engines stopped working and started gliding towards the airport. Here, the tower controller flickered the runway lights on and off to help the pilots find their way to the runway amidst the darkness of the Atlantic Ocean. To stay in the air as long as possible, the captain maintained a descent speed between the recommended glide speed and the stall warning speed. This way, he could control how fast they went down. But it was important to stay high enough because once they went too low, they couldn't go back up. But the captain faced additional challenges. He needed to maintain the speed above 140 knots to ensure power from the ram air turbine while also avoiding speeds over 200 knots, which could complicate landing gear extension. As they neared runway 33, he realized his high altitude strategy might have worked too well. Instead of being at the normal approach altitude of about 3,000 feet, 10 miles from the runway, they were at 13,000 feet just eight miles away. This was much higher than expected, especially with no engine power. To quickly drop altitude, the captain performed a 360 degree turn, a technique often used in gliding to lose about 4,000 to 5,000 feet. Okay. At the same time, the first officer put down the landing gear and adjusted the slats at the front of the wings. These steps were vital giving the plane more lift and letting it slow down without too much drag. 
After a 360 degree turn, the captain leveled the plane's wings as they neared the runway. However, they were still dealing with being at the wrong altitude. Too high for a normal landing approach, but too low to try another complete turn to lose altitude. With no room for mistakes, every move and decision was critical as the plane mm -hmm. headed for the runway without any opportunity for do-overs. On the final approach, the first officer carefully watched the airspeed. Because both engines flamed out, they couldn't use flaps, meaning they had to land at a much faster speed of about 200 knots instead of the usual 145 knots. The first officer played a crucial role, constantly updating the captain on airspeed and altitude, helping him manage the challenging landing. Moments later, the aircraft hit the runway hard, causing 8 out of 12 tires to burst. The plane bounced back into the air before touching down again, almost 3,000 feet from the start of the runway. As the plane sped down the runway, slowing it down became a major challenge. Important features that usually help slow the plane, like wing spoilers and engine reverse thrust, were not working. To make things more difficult, the system that prevents the wheels from skidding didn't work properly, causing the wheels to lock up when the captain tried to use the brakes. The aircraft managed to stop just 600 feet short of the runway's end. Fires had broken out in the left main gear wheels, heightening the emergency. Captain Pichet quickly ordered an evacuation, and remarkably, all passengers were out of the aircraft in just 90 seconds, securing their safety. The fire crews, already on standby, quickly put out the fires. Incredibly, all passengers and crew on board survived the ordeal. Follow hey man, clap it up for the pilots. You feel me? Their miraculous landing, the event was marked as the longest glide by a passenger aircraft in aviation history without any fatalities. The crew was initially celebrated as heroes. However, as time passed, questions surfaced about the events leading to the critical fuel shortage over the Atlantic. Doubts began to circulate regarding the crew's decision-making, especially why they appeared to overlook their instrument's warnings of rapidly decreasing fuel levels. Following the incident, significant changes were made to aviation safety protocols. Airbus introduced a new warning system in their flight management computers, designed to alert pilots to a significant fuel loss, a key indicator of a potential fuel leak. Moreover, training now emphasizes the effective management of fuel leaks and the interpretation of non-normal checklists more strongly. The final report acknowledged the pilot's failure to detect the fuel leak, but praised their exceptional response after the engines failed. It commended the captain for expertly controlling the aircraft during the engine's out-descent and landing, despite the challenging conditions. The first officer was praised for providing valuable support during the glide and landing. The captain and first officer were therefore honored with the Superior Airmanship Award by the Airline Pilots Association. In conclusion, three primary factors contributing to the incident can be identified. Firstly, the improper installation of the spare engine was identified as the root cause of the fuel leak. Secondly, the crew's lack of training in handling fuel leak-related imbalances and the absence of such scenarios led them to focus solely on balancing fuel without considering the possibility of a leak. Lastly, cognitive bias played a role as the crew's assumptions hindered their ability to recognize and address the situation effectively. Let's think about what we can learn from this important story. It teaches us how- Hi, shit, hi, shit. We don't even know all that, bro. But, hey, man, if y'all made it this far into the video, don't forget to smash that thumbs up, share the video, and subscribe. And let me know what y'all think of the reaction, bro. Did y'all enjoy it? Or did y'all not like it, you feel me? And let me know what kind of reaction y'all want to see. And I will drop it for y'all. You feel what I'm saying? But yeah, man, appreciate y'all for tuning into the video once more. And yeah, bro. Literally, bro. I ain't gonna lie before I go out. Have a few things to say. Like I was saying, bro. 
I don't want to be caught up in that. And good job to them pilots for actually, you know, um, putting the people that was in the airplane lives at their hands. You know what I'm saying? Because some pilots, out of nowhere, they would just have been like, okay, that's it, bro. And well, there's nothing we could do about it. But these pilots was actually trying to survive. You know what I'm saying? They was looking at procedures, what to do, or how to make them boys survive, and how to, like, control the plane when there's no power. You get what I'm saying? But... Hey, bro, I don't never wish that on nobody because, yeah, bro, we're not birds. We can't fly if something just go wrong, you know what I'm saying? So, once we in that sky, bro, if something happens, bro, that's it, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, bro, don't forget to smash that thumbs up, share the video, and subscribe for more reactions, and I'm going to catch you on the next one.